everybody. Very rarely does a drummer come from behind the kit to speak a word. Um, and fun fact, some drummers drum without shoes on. Um, it helps with dexterity and movement around the kit. So this morning, um, we're about to see the song called Build My Life. And there's a part in the end of the bridge that goes um, firm foundation. And I thought about that word this week, firm foundation. What does that look like to us as children of God? How do we activate that power that Jesus gives us throughout the week? And something he told me this morning, for the people who have come here with addictions, who are struggling, who have been told that they're not worth anything, I want to tell you that God does not make mistakes. He does not make mistakes. So if you are feeling that this morning, I pray that the love of Christ covers you, covers us. If you're needing that firm foundation, Jesus can come in and abolish what the devil has put into your heart and go and give you victory this week over any addiction, any struggle, and help you to win in your life. I'll pray for us before we sing this song. Um, Jesus, we come to you this morning and we thank you for your love, for bringing us all up here safely, giving us safe travel. Um, Build your kingdom in us so we can go into the world and show the light. Um, help us to know that Jesus is the connection between unholy man and the heavenly father. And he will come over us and give us the victory we need. We thank you for your love. And we pray that you be with Pastor Mark as he brings us a sermon. And we have ears to hear and hearts um, and minds to receive that message. And we just thank you for your love, Jesus, and thank you for today. This is in your precious name we pray. Amen. God, as we go to your word, this true foundation, God, we thank you for the fact that you have provided this word for us. We, we thank you that you have provided your grace for us. God, I pray that you would help us today to continue in the spirit. God, that spirit, you would continue to, to speak to us, to make yourself known, to, to give us direction and clarity. God, I thank you for the opportunity, the, the awesome opportunity to lift our voices to you. God, I pray that as we continue in this time together that, that we would experience your leadership, that we would embrace that which you have for us. We pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. There's two men off the coast of California, both afloat on the Pacific Ocean. One's in a Catalina 257 sports sailboat. Uh, the other is clinging to what's ever left of his ship. Which one do you think wants rescue? There's two women. They're in church. They're, they're singing. One is singing with great joy. One is celebrating the fact that her child is finding purpose in life, is finding direction in life. The other mother tries to sing. The, the words barely come out because she's greatly grieved because her husband wants nothing to do with the Lord. Which woman wants relief? There's two students, two teenagers. They're in school. One's first chair president of this class, straight A's. The other student, instead of being picked for the team, gets picked on by the team. Can't make his grades. Which student can't wait for that last bell of the day? When you answer those questions, when you think about those examples, you are going to begin to understand the Thessalonian Christians. These are a very small group of people this group has come together with this wonderful news of a Savior, this wonderful news that Christ has given them life, and as they have done so, they have a joy within. At the same time as this joy within, they have pressure from without. Those, as we've talked about over the last few weeks, those of faith background, particularly Jewish background, are saying to them from one side, you are foolish, you are falling for a cult, you're falling for a false teaching. On the other side of things, they're being uninvited to parties, they're, they're being taken away from social status because now they have said, I'm standing by a different set of morals. I am going to be a different person. And friends, and even closer to that family, are rejecting these people. And so they are looking in this world, and they, 
perhaps more than any other at their time, understand what it means to be in the world but not of it. To be in the world but not of it. And in this context, as we have seen throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians so far, is there is this longing for rescue. There's this longing for relief. There's the longing for the last bell to ring. The longing for, specifically, Jesus Christ to return and to set things right. I want us to revisit, we're going to be in chapter 4 and 5, but before we get there, I want to revisit a verse out of chapter 1, which is going to help us understand this. This is chapter 1, verse 6. Paul, Silas, and Timothy say this, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. There is a great joy in their lives given by the Holy Spirit, and a large portion of that joy comes from this fact. They know that this is temporary. They know that their life is not going to go on forever. Now, you know as well as I that there are times where we wish life would continue on a little longer. Uh, we're in that groove of life. We're, we're doing well. Things are going well. People around us love us. We love the people around us. Our job's successful. Our family's successful. We are healthy. And we say, God, I want you to come back, but can you hold off a little bit? There's other times where things just seem to be falling apart and they're not going so well and you feel adrift on the sea, clinging to any board you can find, and you realize, you know what? It would be quite all right with me, Lord Jesus, if you came back right now. These people here in Thessalonians, to Thessalonica, to understand these people, you need to understand that they are the latter. They are the ones who want Jesus to return immediately. And Paul says to them, keep hope in this. Keep trusting the fact that indeed the Lord is going to return. So on that note, go to chapter 4, and we're going to begin... In the latter part of, of chapter 4, which we covered the first part last week, and look at verse 13. We're going to read on into chapter 5. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's, Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. But the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. For let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love and as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. As we look at that text, again, mainly focused on the return of Christ, and particularly focused on the fact that Jesus is returning not just for those who are alive, but those who have died in Christ, meaning those who have died either in the anticipation of the Messiah short for people of the Old Testament, as well as people of the days of Jesus, when Jesus was walking the earth and they, they came to Christ. You've already had disciples die. You've already had followers of Jesus die. And they're concerned about these people. So not only what will happen to themselves, but what will happen to those people who have gone before. As we look at this text, I want us to look at four questions. I want to attempt to answer these questions as we look at these. So look at these questions with me. The first question we have is, what are their concerns? I've already mentioned some of those, but what are their concerns? What are they concerned about? What are they 
really thinking about on a day-to-day basis and why would Paul, Silas, and Timothy be urged and led to ask, answer this question, answer their concerns? Second question is, uh, then what did they, on what did they base their convictions? On what did they base their convictions? In other words, they have concerns, but they also have answers to them, and they have to have some foundation. We, we've talked about this, and Stanley talked about this, this fact that if you're going to stand on something, it must be firm. And they have convictions. They have things that are going to hold them together. Third question is, of what are they confident? Now, I, when you say confidence, when I say confidence, I want you to think of the word, this is undoubting trust. This is the idea that I will go to my deathbed believing this. Fourth question is, to what are they called? Now, Paul, particularly Paul, Silas and Timothy as well, but particularly Paul, Paul is saying to them, here are some things that you need to do as you wait. Remember, we've talked about last few weeks that some people, as they wait, tend to go over here and say, well, he's going to be a while, so I'll just go about my life. And other people say, well, I wish he'd come back now, and so I'm just going to sit here and wait for him to come back. And Paul says, you, not, you need to do neither. You need to be fully, fully in, in, anticipating the return of Jesus Christ, but at the same time, you need to be active in living out his gospel. So let's look at that first question. What are their concerns? Well, one of the first questions is, what happens to those who have gone before? Let's revisit that, verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I love the fact that they're not simply concerned about their own well-being. These are people who say, yes, but what about those people before? Part of this is brought upon by the conflict they're having with other people. Because part of they are being accused of believing a false gospel. They're accused of believing something that simply is not true. And distance themselves from the faith of the past. And here Paul says, because you are believing in this, you are a continuation of the faith of the past. You are following the one who is the fulfillment of this. Now I find it interesting, there's this phrase in there, and I find it really interesting, the phrase I'm going to mention here in a second, is in there because most of the Christians here in this group are Gentiles. But he used a phrase from a Jewish tradition, particularly that of Isaiah. Listen to the prophet Isaiah, verse 20, uh, chapter 27, verse 13. It says this, In that day a great trumpet will sound. Those who are perishing in Assyria and those who are exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. The Assyrian people have, have wiped out Israel. The Egyptians have imprisoned Israel. And God says this, take heart. There will be a trumpet call. And at this trumpet call, I'm going to bring my people back. I am going to bring my people back. This great blast of the trumpet. And Paul uses the same analogy. God uses the same image through Paul to say, look, I am coming, and I am going to announce it loudly. I am going to make sure no one misses out on this, and no one can misunderstand. I truly am coming. And so they say, okay, the people have gone before are going to be raised in Christ. And that is why he uses this Old Testament language to tell even the people who have died in hope of the Messiah are raised in Christ because of his love for them. This is the question, what will happen to them? Well, they will be raised. Well, then they have the question of, okay, I get this, but when is he going to return? I want you to hear some words of a man named James Clark. He says this. He says, the Christian theology of the first century was built upon the belief in the speedy return of the Lord. And the early Christian assumed that all who accepted him and received the Spirit would take part in the blessed event. This hope sustained them in their tribulations, nourished them, nourished their courage, and refreshed their hearts. In its power, they faced their bitter trials with quiet faith. It was the morning star in their dark sky, but the Lord did not come. Time passed, and no trumpet of God sounded. They were still being oppressed and harried. The haughty and evil kings of the earth were still on their thrones, so their hearts began to fail, and their, and their minds to be disturbed. Perhaps you feel their pain. This is clearly from the Gospels and from the writings. People thought Jesus was going to return immediately. For instance, Paul says it's good to remain single. There's better things to be doing than worry about marriage. You need to be 
single so you can serve the Lord. He also is saying over and over, he is coming back. One of the mysteries of the, of the gospel is how much did Jesus know and not know. And he clearly says only the Father knows. And he, he, he talks about language that seems to be saying that those of you who are still alive when I return, talking to the first century people. And so you have people, including Christ perhaps, who are saying Christ is coming back soon. But soon became a little longer and longer and longer and longer. As long as I'm alive, I have heard it me and said, as long as you are alive who are older than I, you have heard it said, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And guess what? Jesus hasn't come back yet. And so Paul says to these people, now approximately 20, 30 years after Christ has said, I'm coming back. So a generation after. And they're getting frustrated. They are persecuted for their faith, unlike most of us, if not all of us. They are being threatened. They are being ridiculed. They are being pushed out of everything in their society, and they are struggling. And they're saying, Jesus, where are you? And Paul says, keep the faith, keep the faith, keep the faith. Chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So it's going to be a surprise. You don't know when it's going to happen, but check this out. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor, pain, as labor pains on the pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But he goes on to say to them, but you don't have to be afraid of this thief. You do not, not be afraid of the return of Jesus Christ because you are ready. You're ready. I, I love this image. I love this image. That even when Jesus comes back, and even if we don't know when he's coming back, and we certainly don't, that when he comes, we are prepared. We are ready. And so what do they base the convictions on? We'll look at verse 14. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. This is a word about death. Often that word in the New Testament, alive, awake, dead, asleep. This is an image. This is this truth again that Jesus, we believe Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring Jesus with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in him. Look at Paul's words in Romans. He says a similar thing in Romans chapter 8, verses 8 through 9, verse uh, chapter 6. Now we, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, we cannot die, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. It, it is a wonderful thing to know that they are saying that just as Christ was raised, we will be raised. That death does not have the last answer. And one of my favorite passages of Paul, in addition to many others, one of my favorite passages of Paul is where he looks into the face of death, quoting the Old Testament. And he says, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? And I can tell you as a pastor, when I perform a, a service, a, a funeral service for a Christian, it is wonderful to stand before a group of people who know that person is a Christian. And we can mock death. We can say to death, where, O oh victory, is your sting? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh death, is your victory? In other words, death, you do not have the final answer. Folks, if you're a believer, that is the truth. And that is what this means to be ready for the thief who comes in the night. That when you believe in Jesus Christ, you can mock death itself. Get hold of that. I fear, I do not fear death. I have absolutely zero fear of death. Zero fear of death. Now, ways in which I can die, that might be scary. But the end result, I have no fear of it. I can tell you confidently, I stand on the foundation that the second I die, I'm with Jesus. I hope you have that same faith. I hope you do, because if you don't, you are surprised like some of them are going, well, I'm just not sure. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. Oh, and some people say, well, I don't know if he's coming back. And he hasn't come back in 2,000 years in our case. So maybe I can just hold off a little bit. I can just hold off a little bit. I had a man this morning uh, before I came, and I was talking to him in another place this morning, and I was talking to him, and he, he knows I'm a pastor, and he said, well, say a few words for me today. And I said, well, how about you come he hear him yourself? And, uh, and uh, he, he's not here, so we're going to keep working on him. Uh, but, but he said, you know, I can use anything I can get. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to keep saying them for you until you get here. 
he says, he went into a longer story about why he's not here, but it was a wonderful conversation. And there is a question in his mind. There's a question. And folks, there is not a question in my mind. And if you are a believer in Christ, there is no question in your mind if you take the word of God as it says. And this is where they base their faith as well. Chapter 4, verse 14. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. I may be alive when Jesus comes back, or I may be long gone, but I know that I am ready. I want you to remember the picture, the setting. Jesus intentionally has waited long enough to, to allow Lazarus to pass. It's been a few days. He's taken the long road to get, instead of the short road, take the long road to get there. And, and Martha comes to him in, in utter despair. Jesus, we called for you in plenty of time. Where are you? Why don't you wait? And right there, Jesus sees the right moment. Jesus says, this is the time that I am going to give the great confession. This is where I'm going to very clearly say who I am. And there's two people in the Gospels, or excuse me, in the writings of the New Testament that most clearly say who Jesus is. One of them, Peter, second of Mary. Excuse me, Martha. There is Martha and there is Peter, and they both clearly say, this is who you are, Jesus. In addition to that, Thomas, one of my favorite, my Lord and my God. And then you have Peter and you have Martha. And let me tell you about Martha, John, John 11. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? I love that he gave her a direct question yes no do you believe this yes lord i believe you are the messiah yes i believe this and martha has a great faith even in check this out even in the face of death her brother buried but yet i believe that you are the resurrection they base this on the word of god so upon what of what were they confident one person says christian christianity is a faith of hope. Christianity is a faith of hope. In other words, I have great hope which fuels my faith which is based upon Jesus Christ. And they had this trust. They said that Jesus will come and Jesus will come for those who have gone before and Jesus will come for me. Check out verse 17 again. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Picture the man on the cross next to Jesus. He says, unlike the other one, Jesus, you, you don't deserve to be up here. I do. I'm a criminal. I'm a murderer. This is justice. What's happening to you, that's not justice. That's anger. That's wrath. What's happening to me is justice. And Jesus looks upon the face of this criminal who like himself is hanging from a cross and he says, fear not. I tell you the truth, this day you will be with me in paradise. He is given this promise. F folks, I want you to know this promise is for you as well. It was for the thief on the cross. It is for you as well. So in the midst of this, what are they called to do? Part of that obviously is hope, but there's also other things they are to do as well. Look at verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another. You see, we need hope. And one way we can do this is by encouraging one another. The close of this service, we're going to have an awesome opportunity to get involved in small groups, to sign up for small groups. Folks, this is the way that Rabbit Creek Church people encourage one another. When we can gather together in small group, whether children or youth or adults, singles, married, no matter what stage of life, we have small groups for you. And some people say, you know what, I just can't connect at church. You know, I just don't feel really a part of the body. That's because you're not involved in a group that can encourage you. That's because you have chosen not to be a part of a group where people can get to know you. This is too big of a group for people to get to know you. But if you can plug into a group where people can say, how are you doing this week? I missed you last week. Oh, you remember that prayer request you mentioned last week? How's that going? When you can have those things, you need to encourage one another. And this is what he's saying, encourage one another. Verse 11 of chapter 5, therefore encourage, second time he said this, one another, and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. 
And then he uses kind of a play on words. In addition to encourage one another, he says, be sober. Now, there's two calls to that. The way they understood that in the first century. One is how we would say this. This is don't be intoxicated. Don't be intoxicated. Drunkenness is stupidity. I'm clouding my mind, and I can't even think clearly. It's not a smart thing to do. He said, you need to be clear-headed. Don't be intoxicated. But there's a play on words here as well because he's saying don't be intoxicated by life, and, uh, life itself. Some of you choose alcohol and are intoxicated. Some of you choose busyness. Some of you choose workaholism. Some of you choose entertainment. Some of you choose staring at your smartphone. Some of you choose whatever it is, and you get intoxicated on things of this world, and you miss out on opportunities. You miss out on opportunities for God. And he says, be clear-headed. That's what he's saying. Be clear-headed. Verse 8, he says, but since we belong to the day, in other words, since we're alive, act like it. (laughs) You're not dead. Be alive. And some of us walk around, can I say half dead? Is that even right? But, but it's like we're half dead. It's like we're, we're distracted by so many things. And God is saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And we miss it sometimes because we're not sober. And I don't mean that you're, maybe you're not alcoholic, but you're intoxicated on something else as well. This is the gospel. And in the same verse, hear it again. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as the helmet so in addition to being sober you need to put on armor because first of all you're clear-headed but then you also need to be protected and paul loves this analogy he uses elsewhere in his writings where he says put on the armor of god and he's saying it here as well so now you're clear-headed but you got the armor now think about this in the military you need to be both clear-headed and you need to be armored up you can have the most equipped and clear-headed soldier going out in the battle but without the armor pretty foolish You can have a person who from head to toe is clad in armor, but they're in a stupor, and how good of a warrior will they be? And so he combines the two, and he says, be sober and be well-fitted. Have the armor of God upon you. And all of this is for this reason. The entire text from chapter 4, verse 13 to chapter 5, verse 11, he's asking this question. Are you ready? Are you ready? And that is my question for you, is are you ready? There's all things, a lot of things we talk about at church, and they're all important, or we wouldn't talk about them. We talk about serving the community. We talk about missions. We talk about our ministries of different age groups. We talk about small groups, as we're going to focus on here in just a minute again. But ultimately, it all comes back to this one question. Are you ready? Because we also talk about growth in Christ, growth in our relationship with Christ. But if we've never started a relationship with Christ, we're not ready. And so if you have this same joy, if you have this same faith to which Paul points, about which I've been talking, that I know that whenever I am to go home, I am ready for that moment. I know that I'm going to be with Jesus. Do you have that same hope? Listen to the text again, verse 16 and 17. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next week. Don't wait till you have your life together. Say, Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready. If you cannot walk out of this door this morning and say, I am confident that I'm ready for death, don't leave this room. Don't leave this room. I don't know what's going to happen to you when you walk through those doors. But I do know, no matter what happens to you when you walk those doors, that if you are ready to experience Jesus Christ, then you can have peace. Do not leave this room until you know the answer to that question. And you can say yes. So just a moment, we're going to have small group leaders, and we're going to have people going around inviting you to be a part of a small group. Uh, we have groups that are part of connection groups that encourage one another groups, if you will, to borrow from this text, Connect, connecting with life together. And you have opportunity to sign up for some of those connection groups. Uh, we have change groups. These are the folks that mainly have them short term where they focus on a 